So we're going to be looking at chapter 6 um, from a Christian manifesto. Chapter 6 is called An Open Window. Um, just before beforehand, I just want to say for you guys to forgive me if I have to take a drink of water. Uh, the last time I was up here, my lips were sticking together like a duck. So, so yeah. So with that, let's just let's go ahead and pray. Father, we just thank you for this day, God. I'm just so thankful to come together and, and fellowship. And God, as we go through this book, Lord, I pray that it would apply to our lives, God, that we could take the information from it and um, just equip ourselves. And God, just to continue to be a light in this world. And Lord, we love you and we thank you and we ask this in your name. Amen. So in chapter 6, An Open Window, what Francis wanted his readers to understand that there was two tracks of mind. In this chapter, the first track is in regards to the open window. And what Francis was referring to was the conservative swing in 1980. And what Francis wanted was for Christians to take action or rather step up in this time that he was referring to as the open window. And this was in regards to possibly Ronald Reagan winning the presidency. Um, and Francis looked at this as an opportunity politically for Christians to fight against abortion and regain influence in the culture. And the reason Francis may have thought this was because before Reagan, you had Jimmy Carter, you had the Roe versus Wade that was approved by the Supreme Court in rights, for the rights of uh, women's choice in 1973. And leading up to this, uh, Ronald Reagan, the Ronald Reagan people were, or leading up to Ronald Reagan, people were fed up with the liberals, big government, inflation, and political issues. So things seemed to be looking good, and so there was this glimpse of hope, so to speak. And then in the second track was in regards to if the open window closed. Basically, the result of it closing would be that nobody would take action, and Christians would just be complacent, I guess you could say. And sadly, it seems that we went down that second track in regards to where we are today. Francis even mentioned that the more ground you give these humanists, it gets harder to regain control and have influence on culture. From the time of Francis Schaeffer till today, we can see how much ground they have taken, and they're not letting up. It's never enough until conservatives, those with morals, and God-fearing Christians have their rights stripped away. Francis also used an example of two groups. One of the group was the counterculture young people coming out of the 70s going into the 1980s who got involved in the political system. And this was probably because they wanted to have an influence or an impact on the culture. And the second group was the ones Nixon had referred to years before as the silent majority. According to Francis, this majority within the silent majority is made up of mostly older, older people who wanted, one was personal peace, which means that they wanted to be left alone. You know, they, they didn't want to be troubled with anything. They didn't want no drama. It was just, you know, leave me alone. And the other, the other one was affluence, which was made up of the group of people who wanted prosperity, material abundance. They basically wanted a good life as long as they weren't bothered. So basically, there was two different groups of people, but soci sociologically, they were the same. They were the same group because at the heart of it, they were basically in neutral. They, they had no drive to make changes on a moral level. So Francis uses to say, politically, you can have conservatives and liberals, which are different politically, but they are both humanistic. And if they're both humanistic, there's not going to be no difference and there will be no change. It sounds like a lot of what happened in this past election, right? We see this today with Republicans, also called rhinos, you know, and, and other politicians. They claim to be for one group, but they're not. And at the heart of it, their foundation is humanistic. They can be manipulated, bought, and many times vote in favor of things that go against the Bible and supposed values that they're supposed to hold. But I would add, this isn't just politically, but even on the religious level as well. You have many people who call themselves Christians today, but their actions seem to be by name only. You know, I know of people who, I guess you could say, voted for Biden. They call themselves Christians. 
And to me, it's like, how does that make sense? You call yourself Christian, but yet these people support abortion, homosexuality, and everything else under the sun. Again, it's like they're only Christian by name only. Like I've said, you know, and I've said this before, us Christians, we're Christians before anything else. Christ and his word is our foundation for our decisions and our moral direction. And Francis point out, going on, he says, if this open window closed or these humanists continue to gain more and more ground, it would lead to some form of elite authoritarianism. What type of elite authoritarianism? I'm going to read um, in this book, because it was too long to, to jot down. So, But he talks about what this elite authoritarianism would look like, and he quotes some guys. And mind you, this book was written 41 years ago, so it's, it's pretty crazy. He says, what form of elite might take over? A number of thinkers have set forth their predictions. John Kenneth Galbraith has suggested an elite composed of intellectuals, especially from the academic and scientific world, plus government. Daniel Bell, a professor of sociology at Harvard University, saw an elite composed of select intellectuals made up of those who control the use of technological explosion, a technocratic elite. And it literally, it sounds like exactly what has come about today with social media, silencing people, blacklisting them, removing accounts. It's astonishing. And Francis even mentions how these elites may even get hold of the courts and if so, begin to pass all kinds of laws that they see fit. Again, it it seems exactly what we are facing today. We Americans, many of us have become so complacent as long as we have our wealth, our material luxuries, our phones, our Instagram, Snapchat, all our apps, you know, and we're plugged into the phone. Who cares what laws are passed? Who cares what's going on out there? And, th- and sadly, that's the mindset today. What's even more of a shame is seeing how many Christians are amongst this group of people. Not just because Christians aren't speaking up, but because many welcome sin and Caesar into the house of God. You know, when Brad covered chapter 5, he pointed out how the Wesleys and Whitfield brought social action. And man, we, we are in need of social action. And social action is driven by the gospel, and it's also us making a stand against tyranny. You know, hearing Brad talking about how him and Tiffany went down to Riverside, you know, and, and seeing them in the protesting down there was, was very encouraging. And it's, again, some people may say, oh, well, politics isn't my thing. You know, especially a lot of people within the, in the Christian world. And my answer to that is, you know, you're going to just stay silent, and eventually it comes into our churches, our house, our families. We have the freedom right now to make that stand, right, politically, and that's what we should be doing. Francis goes on to point out, it doesn't matter if you're a Protestant, Roman Catholic, Jew, etc. When it comes to these laws that they can eventually pass. The fact is, those in power who are humanist will stop at nothing to re- remove any form of belief rooted in Judeo-Christian belief. The truth is, God's word doesn't just touch on the spiritual, but in every sphere of life, politically, in the workplace, family, and etc. Not only has a humanist been gaining ground and control in the culture, but now it's led them to bringing the fight to the church. Listen to this. Francis points out, that a lawyer by the name of Samuel E. Erickson was defending Grace Community Church, John MacArthur's church, over a malpractice suit. The parents were suing because their son committed suicide and he was under the care by them and they were, he was never referred to a psychiatrist or psychiatric help. And, and do you see what's happening? And it's been going on for a while. It's this stuff that Francis was dealing with and fighting in his day secular humanists and Christianity clashing with one another has been going on ever since. But they've slowly taken the fight to the church and they already gained, have already gained some of the ground politically. And they, and, but thank God that there's some pushback there. But like again, like I was kind of saying it, how it's creeping into the church. And what does leadership do? They cave, right? You know, it goes something like this. For example, you're not qualified to give psychological or any type of counseling. And what does churches do? They hire psych- psychologists. 
And again, I'm not against the medical aspect of thing as far as psychology and all that stuff goes. It's just the fact that God has given us, he's, he's laid it out in his word on how to counsel his people, how he, how he sees fit of doing things. And yet we try to see what's best according to our, our perspective. And then again, another example. Oh, you're feminist for not having women in leadership. And I bring this up too because I've heard, this is stuff I've heard. This is stuff I've been told, uh, you know, what people's issues are with churches. And again, what does churches do? They go out and hire women pastors. And many churches nowadays just drop the elder deacon title altogether and roll with something along the lines of director or creative arts leader or secretary of a secretary. Just kind of throwing that out there. <laughs> Anything to avoid titles so they can compromise. We all know where compromise leads to, and for many of us, we see it. Churches teaching CRT. And I don't know if you guys have been following critical race theory and how it's in, starting to just really flood into the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, you know, and then you have homosexual, you know, you see all these things in here of homosexual pastors performing marriages and everything else. And time and time again, we are seeing churches catering to these humanists and to the state. The fight is very real. It's not about pleasing them. It's never about pleasing them. They have only one goal, and that is to destroy anything Christian. People like, like to walk that line, and they give a little, give a little. The next thing you know it, your church isn't even a church. Francis talked about an open window in this chapter, and the time for wondering if we are in an open window has long passed. The result of two tracks Francis spoke of, we obviously went down the second track. And really, the open window he spoke of was closed. But, the, but there's good news. And the good news is it seems a lot of people have turned out this past election. You know, I guess you could say the silent majority, right? Um, and, and it was encouraging to see how many people don't want tyranny. They don't want this godless society. There's, there's still a glimpse of hope. And now, and now what, will, what will that look like if we, if we Christians make a stand? On one hand, we say, no more, and we fight politically. And on the other hand, we bring the gospel. We make those stands early. We make those stands now as we have the rights as Christians to defend our churches, to defend our family, and to defend God's moral law. And this is just my personal opinion. It may seem that they're gaining ground and have won, but they have actually lost. We have Christ, a conquering king, and he is on the throne. And I don't believe the window will ever be fully closed. Francis Schaeffer and great men like him have been warning us. And it's, and it's astonishing to me that we haven't taken action. It's just... I mean, you know, this is stuff he, again, he was arguing over over 41 years ago. And this was stuff that was building up, leading up to 1980. And now, 41 years later, it's like, oh my gosh, where did the time go, you know? And the time for wondering if things are going to get better is we, we just need to stop and just stand up and, and be bold. And we as Christians must, like I said, act now defending our churches biblically and praying and that more leadership will be gospel-centered out there and that they would start acting like lions rather than cowards. Our open window is now, church. And so we need to, go, we need to take that action, right? And I just, uh, what was that, like four minutes? <laughs> so with that, is there any questions or anything you guys would like to add? Go ahead, Brad. Yeah, I just, uh, on, on the point of the window still being open, you know, listening to Doug Wilson, he talks about, uh, you know, East and West, uh, Germany or whatever, the wall being built. Um, and I'm kind of paraphrasing what he, what he says, but, you know, if there was a time to, to stop that in its tracks, it's, you know, you take the bulldozer when they're starting to lay the bricks. That's when it's easiest. That's mm. when you, that's when you fight back. Um, it is a lot harder once the wall's already been built to do that right. Mm. Our wires up. And, uh, yeah, I agree, man. I don't think the window is completely closed. I don't think it ever will be, but uh, 
you know, I, it feels tedious. We've been in this for a year and a half, and it feels tedious and relentless. Um, but I do think the time is now. And you can't, you know, and on, on the point of, of ah, people saying that politics are being libertarian in that sense, um, I think it's impossible to stay out because it's coming for you. Yeah. Right. You want it to or not, you know? Right. So I think those kind of, those two things kind of work in your hand. A, you can't, you can't stay out of politics because it's coming for you. It's going to affect your life. Exactly. B, the time is absolutely now. Yeah, I, I actually seen that video that you were talking about, yeah. like, I think sometime last week. And it was it was very encouraging. Yeah. It's like, man, we, you know, we got to get on it, fight now. now. And and it, going to like how uh, Francis quoted about technology and how you know this would be used in a form of authoritarianism. You know, I mean, in my personal opinion, they they have control of the media, they have control of the news, and everything like that. So it's so hard to see, you know, what's really if if all you do is watch the, like your head's always in media, CNN, for example, um, you would think that the world's coming to an end tomorrow and that, you know, the majority of the world is for critical race theory and, and all that. But out there, I, I guess because I'm so optimistic, I, I tend to think, like Brad said, you know, it, it, we need to act now. Um, there's no time to think about, you know, oh, well, Maybe this will pass, things will get better. And every individual person should be taking action, you know, starting within our communities, whether it's volunteering, you know, at abortion and, and you know, political, getting involved in politics. I mean, sadly, there's not a lot of Christians, Christians involved in politics. There's a lot of people that, you know, will stand up there and say they're against abortion and stuff like that, which that, that's great, but where's those God-fearing politicians? You know, so. Anybody else? Jimmy? Think about what the reformers have done. Some of them chose to work with their local government, believing that if it was the Lord's will for the Reformation to flourish, that God would reform the hearts and give allegiance with some of the government. Now, there are debates among reformers about how to go about doing that and doing that at all. But now, here we are, hundreds of years later, God has given us the blessing of a government system that's completely different from the historical system, where we get to elect people. Mm. And the church took advantage of that until within the last hundred years or so. And so I think that goes to a lot of what you're seeing is we're not taking advantage of the blessing the Lord has given us to right. use the government to assist the church. Mm. We can debate whether or not we should be dominionist and that we should take over the world by having the church take over the government and having the two become one. But either way, we can advance the kingdom of God in the gospel if we have Christians in leadership. Right. And we can have biblical law govern the land to some extent if we have Christians putting law and enforcing law. Right. But without us believing that this is a good thing that God has blessed us with, we're starting to see the repercussions of that change of evangelicalism by having more immoral people, if not just completely straightforward evil people, take over leadership and ignore the godly laws and start putting in evil laws. Hmm. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I mean, you know, for years you always hear of, you know, I mean, it's like, it's it basically kind of just going what you're saying is that for years we've just kind of sat back and just allowed things to play out. You know, if the gospel, if we talk and preach about how powerful the gospel is and that it covers every sphere of life, why isn't it? You know, it's obviously not the gospel. It's us that are not taking it out to the world and into our communities and so yeah lately for me I, i've been really convicted so but Would anything connect this shift politically with the church to the massive increase throughout the last 75 years or so of uh dispensational pre-tribulational rapture theory permeating throughout evangelicalism and becoming the most pervasive view getting away from a covenantal 
post mill or all mill millennial view. Mm. With the, as you talked about earlier, you talked about being optimistic. Well, if you have an optimistic eschatology, then you seek to preserve and restore rather than just, well, it's going to get horrible anyway. We're going to be escaped down, so why do I have to bother with this? Right, right. All right. Let's go ahead and pray. Uh, Father, we just thank you once again, and just, God, please uh, help us to apply these these uh, convictions and the stuff that we read about and learn about into our lives. God, that we would, as Christians, go into every sphere in this world, God, in our workplace, our family, our communities, and God, that we would be a light in a dark world, that we would preach the gospel, that we would stand our ground, Lord, and that we would be reminded each and every single day that you are the conquering king, God. You are with us every step of the way. And Lord, remind us of this, convict us of this. And God, we pray that you would bless this message today. Uh, bless Martin as he gets ready to deliver this message and that your spirit would fall upon this place and that it would empower him. And God, we just love you and we praise your holy name. Amen.